Father, we pray this evening that you would indeed be our vision, that everything else would be cleared from our sight, that our minds would be uh, clear and open, that you would give us receptive hearts to your word. Lord God, that you would be the one true affection of our lives, the one true affection of our hearts, that we might set our minds on things above rather than things of a temporal or vacuous nature, Lord, that we would look unto you and that we would store up for ourselves treasure in heaven where things cannot be destroyed and where things are imperishable. Lord, uh, we know that we are surrounded by a world that is uh, continuously lusting after the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, the latest fad, the latest uh, trend, the latest fashion, the latest technology. But we give thanks that as your people, we can fix our eyes on the immovable, unchanging God, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you are imperishable, that you are impenetrable, that you are unshakable, that you are consistent, and that you are good, that you are absolutely reliable, and that we can rest in you and rest easy in you at peace, knowing that you, our Savior, have overcome the world, that whilst there are many things that may assail us, where there are many difficulties that might befall us, we give thanks that for those who are in Christ Jesus, that we can know peace in the midst of the storm, we can know peace in the midst of the difficulty, that we can know peace in the midst even of our own failure, with a great promise of restoration with the great promise of victory in Christ. Lord, we thank you for the teaching of Jesus and for his exhortation to his disciples. And even as we considered this morning the reality and the inevitability of failure within our lives, failure that is spectacular and failure that is trivial, failure that is public and failure that is private, how we fail one another, how we fail at certain tasks and how we often fail you. But Lord, we give thanks that even with the foreknowledge of that failure, even with the foreknowledge of our brokenness and sinfulness and uh, weakness and our fragility and uh, our propensity towards sin, we give thanks that you sent Jesus, the author and Savior, uh, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the Savior of the world, that he might bear our sin, that he may meet your righteous standard, that he may satisfy your justice, and that he may liberate us from the bonds of sin and death, that he may place us uh, as part of your family, sons and daughters adopted uh, and welcomed into your presence. And so, Father, we pray this evening that as we wait upon you and as we think upon a familiar portion of Scripture, familiar passage, familiar story, familiar themes. Lord, we give thanks that every time we open your word, there is something new, that there is something of vital necessity for us to hear. 
Uh, and so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us tonight through this passage of your word. We pray for those who are building on the sand, Lord, that you would show them the folly of their ways and the error that they have made, and that you would show them to the rock, the one in whom we may find uh, a suitable and steadfast foundation. This evening, we remember our friend Dan, and we pray that you would be close to him in the distress of uh, experiencing such a, a rapid heart rate and the discomfort and distress that that has brought, the uncertainty that it brings into life. Lord, we commend him and Penny, Ace and Fox, to your care and to, to your keeping. We pray that you would restore Dan in your time and give medics insight as they treat him appropriately. We pray for the funeral tomorrow in Alt Bay. We pray for the McLennan family and the passing of Ian, and we pray that you would be with Penny, and that you would be with Myra and Fiona and Kenneth, and the loss of a father, uh, and uh, the grandchildren and their loss of a grandfather. Uh, we thank you for Ian, for who he was by your grace, and for all that he meant to those who loved him. We thank you for the faith that he owned, and the great hope of heaven for all those who believe. We pray for others tonight who are going through difficulties of one kind or another, uh, Lord, we know little of the trials and travails of each individual life, but you know everyone. You know each and every one intimately, uh, and that you can minister accordingly to each and every one. We pray that you would give us a burden uh, for the brethren, for our uh, fellow uh, men and women, Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, and that we would have genuine concern one for another, that we would uphold one another, uh, we pray that you would implant within the congregation here a desire to pray, that you would bring people together in prayer, in prayer partnerships, and prayer triplets at the prayer meeting, at the early morning prayer uh, on Zoom. Lord, we see the value in prayer. We recognize the great power that there is in prayer, and we pray that you would help us to be faithful in that endeavor, that we would be uh, uh, faithful in, in prayer, that we would be patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, uh, and that we would do all of that to the glory of your name. We pray for our nation. We pray for a turning, a returning unto you. Rather than a turning from you, we pray for a turning to you. Uh, we pray that many would be saved. We pray for our village here, for the surrounding community, for uh, the vast hordes of people who have no interest in you, who are ignorant of the wonder, the truth, the joy uh, of the gospel. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to be fearless uh, proponents of the gospel, preachers of the word, scattering the truth everywhere we go, sharing our testimony of faith that nobody can uh, deny, uh, that your name might be lifted high and that others may see you and know you. We pray for those who are wayward this evening, those whose lives have uh, gone off the rails, as it were, those who have uh, turned from that which is good and pursued that which is uh, destructive and that which uh, has brought decay to, to their life and brings uh, distress to the lives of those who love them. Uh, Father, we pray for those who are uh, addicts, those who are reliant upon uh, drink, those who are uh, reliant upon substances, those whose lives are in uh, turmoil and chaos. Uh, Father, we recognize that there is little that we can do, and yet in your hand all things are possible, that you can take the one who is so far away, and that you can make them a trophy of your grace. We pray that that would be the case for those known and loved within the congregation here even, uh, covenant children who have turned away, uh, covenant children who were uh, born into and baptized in your name into the church, but who have turned away from the things of God, who have disregarded uh, the Savior, and who have turned away from the God of their youth. Uh, Father, we pray that you would work in their hearts and lives and that you might draw them to yourself, that in your time they may recall the truth that was instilled within them, uh, that they would see the witness of their family, uh, and that you might draw them together. We pray for uh, spouses uh, of, of believers who are not yet uh, converted, who do not yet know the Lord Jesus, who are on the broad road that leads to destruction. Father, that you would save them, that you would... Uh, interact with them, that you would draw them to yourself, even yet this evening, that they might know and love and profess uh, the Lord Jesus as Savior and as Lord. Uh, Lord, we pray for those who are uh, struggling within their own minds, those who are uh, beset by uh, illness of one kind or another, those who struggle with anxiety and depression, and 
uh, all of these things that can weigh so heavily on, on one another's minds. Father, we give thanks that you are the light of life and that you can bring light into the darkness, that you can liberate us from the, liberate us from the burden of, of heaviness that so often uh, encompasses our minds. And so, Lord, we commit each and every one to you this evening. We pray that as we read your word now, you would bless it to us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I was going to read a couple of passages this evening. The first of them is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in chapter 3. I'm going to read the whole chapter. And then we're going to read from uh, the closing portion of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. Uh, and we're going to look at that final parable that Jesus gives on the the wise and the foolish builders, uh, and we'll get to that in a moment. But for now, we're going to read this chapter here in 1 Corinthians and chapter 3. This is God's Word. Brothers and sisters, says Paul, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are, who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light." It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If, the, if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and the God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools, so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, He catches the wise in their craftiness, and again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is of God. Amen. The next reading is from Matthew chapter 7, and this is towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is teaching and says these words, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house 
and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading of his word to us. Turn back with me then to Matthew's gospel and chapter 7 this evening for a short time as we look at uh, the final parable there in the Sermon on the Mount and very familiar words. The Leaning Tower of Pisa in Italy is, well, it's the Leaning Tower of Pisa. It's leaning by, I'm reliably told, 17 feet. It's 17 feet off the plumb. It is not uh, it is not right. They have done some work to try and secure it, but there's still no guarantee that it will not fall. What is the reason for this leaning tower? Well, the reason is an insufficient foundation. The foundation is apparently only three meters deep, and whilst building, by the time they got to the second floor of the tower, it had already begun to subside. It had already begun to lean. You might have thought that they would have thought to themselves, well, perhaps we should stop and start again, because the foundations are, are shallow and the ground is soft on one side. This is only going to end in disaster, but no, no. They carried on and they built the tower, and it is there uh, as a great tourist attraction now for everybody that goes to see the leaning tower of Pisa. That tower is leaning because it's built on a faulty foundation. The passage that we've just read is about two builders, about two men who build two houses, but build them on two different types of foundations, and as a result, end up with two different results. This story is well known. We all know the story of the wise and the foolish builders. The wise man built his house upon the rock. We've sung about it since our earliest days. It's often relegated merely to the kids' section of Christianity. And yet, when you take the context uh, of this parable and you see what it is arising out of, you recognize that Jesus was really using this as a significant tool to challenge people about where they were at regarding the gospel and salvation. And so, there is a challenge for us tonight as we read a familiar story and as you look at a familiar theme, where do you stand with Christ? Upon what foundation are you building your life? The house of faith, the house of your life, what is your foundation? Here we have the tale of two builders, and Jesus is giving us some construction instruction, because our foundation is of such fundamental importance to the integrity and to the lifespan of a building, but much more so to our lives. Of course, if you want to have a building that has structural integrity, and if you want to have a building that will last, that will stand the test of time, then it is absolutely incumbent upon you as uh, architect or builder to ensure that the footing of that building is steadfast, it is immovable, it is as solid as it can be in order to ensure the safety of the people within it uh, and the lifespan of the property. When I was working in the property uh, market, you would come across sometimes houses that were of Whitson Fairhurst, which is a steel frame, or a Doran construction where there are bolted uh, concrete panels together. And what you would find is that these properties would be determined non-traditional builds. And being a non-traditional build meant that the mortgage lender wouldn't be able to discern the lifespan of that property, and therefore they would be deemed non-mortgageable. Too much of a risk for the lenders to give money on these houses. Foundations are of such importance just to a house, to a building, but the same applies spiritually as well. The foundations upon which we build our life and faith is of the utmost importance, arguably even more important than the foundations of a home that you will live in for such a short period of time in comparison with the vast space of eternity that awaits each and every one of us. Think about how much time you have invested into your homes. Some of you have built your own homes. 
Some of you have built your own homes with your own hands. Others of you have inherited homes or bought homes that have required huge amounts of renovation, ongoing work. The older the property, the more there is to do. Ongoing upkeep, ongoing. Think about the time that we invest into doing these things in comparison to the amount of time that you have invested into your spiritual foundations. Is there a disparity there? Which is more important? The house that you will live in for a few short years or your soul, which will last for all eternity? Jesus was really concerned about this reality, and that's why He is urging His listeners here in the Sermon on the Mount to consider that very thing, to consider upon what or whom they were building their lives. He's already spoken about many other twos. This is the tale of two builders, but he's spoken about the two ways, the broad road which leads to destruction, and many are on it, and the narrow path that leads to eternal life. There's somebody outside. I don't know if, David, you want to have a look? Uh, There's two teachers. There's the true teacher, and there's the false teacher. Uh, There's the two claims. There's the spurious and the credible. There is that which is true and that which is false. And now we come to this, the two foundations, the enduring and the crumbling. Uh, One foundation that will last, will stand the test of time, regardless of what may come to pass, and the other that may last for a while, that might stand for a time, but ultimately will crumble and will come to ruin. Jesus in the Mount, in the Sermon on the Mount, has already exhorted His listeners, His believers, His followers to turn the other cheek, uh, to, to be salt and light in the world, to avoid lust, to turn away from anger, not to worry, to, to forgive just as they have been forgiven, not to judge other people, not to do their acts of righteousness for men's applause. Then they will have their, their reward but to do things without the knowledge, not to let the left hand know what the right hand is doing when you give or when you fast or when you pray. Uh, And so, all of that has been really significant, weighty teaching. We know that. We went through a study of the uh, Sermon on the Mount not that long ago. I'm sure you remember it all. But right at the end, right at the culmination, right at the climactic point of this sermon that is like no other sermon, Jesus employs this visual He employs this parable, this earthly story with a heavenly significance for those who are listening. He drives home the importance of thinking about how you are living your life, what you are basing your life upon, whether you are building on the sand, which will crumble and fall away and come to nothing, or whether you are building on the rock, which is immovable and unshakable and will not change. So, as we begin this evening, where are you building? We're all builders. We're all building. We're all adding to our lives. We're all learning more every day. We're all giving our credence and giving our thoughts to one thing or to another thing. What is that thing? Is it to the Lord and to the things of an eternal nature that will last and will grow and will flourish? Or is it the things of a trivial, worldly, earthly, temporal nature that will come ultimately to nothing. Good for the moment, good for the immediate, worthless for eternity. Let's turn to the three C's here. That's what the sermon was going to be called this evening. It was going to be called the three C's of construction, and then I realized, well, I'm not giving a seminar on construction, so I had to employ the imagination of my lady wife, and she gave me construction instruction, which is great. But let's go to the three points then that we have Uh, for this evening. Three considerations, shall we say. Firstly, is to consider the comparisons. There are comparisons here between these two men. This parable speaks of two different people, speaks of two men, two builders, uh, and Jesus notes what they do and how they do it, and there are several characteristics that they have in common. It's evident that both of them have heard the words of Jesus. They have heard Jesus sharing His sermon, sharing the message of faith and repentance, how we should live in an upside-down manner if we're following Him, not in the ways of the world, but in the ways of Scripture. So, they've both heard the teaching 
of Jesus, loud and clear. And they've both reacted. They've both built houses. Each of these people built a house based on their understanding, you could argue, of what Jesus said. The house in the parable here is a picture, it's meta, a metaphor for our lives. Each man built his life based upon the truth, based upon the gospel message that Jesus gives, one according to the gospel message, one in the face of the gospel message, turning away uh, from it. So, both heard the words of Christ, both built houses, both built in the same location, I think we could argue here. Verse 27 tells us about the storm that comes, and the storm affects both properties. Both lives are affected by this storm, so you could argue that they must have been building in the same proximity. Both built similar houses. Nothing is said about the houses being wildly different. It's said that they've used, that they both built a house. From the outside, they may have looked largely the same. They might have looked exactly the same. You go and look at housing developments now, and all of the houses are just exactly the same. It's like a, a little Monopoly set or a Lego set. Uh, it's like Toy Town. All of these houses that just look exactly the same, boring. Uh, but the thing is, on the inside of these houses, they'll all be slightly different. Not because necessarily the layout will be different, but because the style will be different, and the decor, and the taste, and the theme, and the ambiance, and the feng shui, and all that kind of uh, jazz within the house. They might look exactly the same on the outside, but they may be wildly different on the inside. Like us, we all look largely the same. Well, to a degree. We're all human. We're all human. We all inhabit a body that is discernibly human, but on the inside, we're all different, uh, and we can all be quite uh, different. The gospel is simple. Sometimes we uh, complicate the gospel. Sometimes we make the gospel uh, inaccessible or unattainable. The gospel is really simple. Paul puts it very well in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. This is the most important thing that Paul passed on to the Corinthian church. What did he say? He said that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, according to the Bible, the infallible inerrant, inspired Word of God, Jesus died for your sins. Jesus died for your transgressions. Jesus died for your failures. Jesus died in order that because you fail and because you sin and because you are uneligible, ineligible for a place in God's kingdom, Jesus said, I will stand in your stead, I will bear your burden, I will take your shame, I will deal with your guilt, and I will give you an invitation to come and to have a place in God's eternal kingdom. That's the gospel. The gospel is good news, and it's simple. If you declare with your mouth and confess, if you confess with your mouth and, and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Good news. Salvation is as simple as believing the gospel, trusting in Jesus uh, as the one who can save us. Our response to the gospel is what is all important. And there's two responses here. One is to take hold of it, lay hold of it, hold on to it, cling to it, cleave to it. The other is to turn away from it. Not necessarily to disregard it completely. Just say, well, you know, I'll just build here. I'll just do this for now. I'll just do my own thing. I might, yeah, I might come back to that. But not today, not today. Our response, your response to the gospel today is of such importance so these men, they, they build houses. Uh, they both hear the words they, of, of Jesus. They both build houses. They build in the same location. They build probably similar houses. It's a picture of us as individuals, isn't it, with common experiences. We work in the same jobs or the same industries. We do the same things. We like the same things. We go to the same churches, hear the same preaching, live the same kinds of lives from the outside. You wouldn't necessarily be able to discern an awful difference and between us, culturally, we are similar in many, many ways. Well, listen, the people that gathered here with Jesus to hear Him preach, they were religious people. No doubt they would have been orthodox in their beliefs. They would have probably have been supporters of the church, responsible citizens. Yet some of them held to Jesus and others turned away. Some of them built upon the rock, founded their lives upon Jesus, 
built on that sure footing. Others, not so much. So, a lot in common, at least on the outside. But then we'll consider, secondly, the contrasts. There's the comparisons first, but then, Bella, there's the contrasts as well. There are several, several similarities, but there are a number of differences between these people. The one man built his house on the sand with little preparation, didn't think much about it, hastily thrown up, no assessment of the ground or the suitability of the land for, for building, just let's get on with it, let's build, let's do it, let's do it now. But we all know that sand is not the greatest of places to be building your house. Why? Because sand is ever-changing. It's, it's an element that's never the same. It's, it's blowing here and there. It's moving to and fro. Sand offers little stability. You can be quite steady on your feet and then stand onto the sand and you're uh, wobbling around like somebody that's uh, been on the drink. Sand offers no stability. It's not a good place to build your house. You think about the sand castles that you build. You use that nice wet hard sand and it slides out the bucket beautifully and you can make a, this elaborate uh, sand castle leave it in the sun for a couple of hours and it's dried out and it's crumbling. The edges are breaking away. You just have to blow on it or look at it funny and another bit falls off. Sand is not a great place to build. In this context here, metaphorically, building on the sand is speaking of people who hear the gospel and understand the truth but reject it. James says, the man who looks in the mirror and who turns away and immediately forgets what he looks like. It's like the parable of the sower, where, where, where the person turns away, the, the thorns strangle out any life of the believer. Instead of believing in Jesus, instead of rooting themselves into the truth of Christ in a world of constant shifting change, they think, no, I'm not going to follow Him. I'm not, I'm not going to surrender myself to, to this Jesus. I'm not going to submit to His Word and to His will fully. I'm not going to do that. I, I, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to forge my own path. I'm going to build my own empire of sorts. I'm going to, I'm going to follow the way of human philosophy. I'm going to, I'm going to carve out a path of, of human, from human wisdom or opinion or even religious achievement, religious right, religious orthodoxy, traditionalism, etc., driven by the outward appearance. What did Jesus call that? Whitewashed tombs. Look good on the outside, empty on the inside. People who build on the sand in this sense are those who choose to try and save themselves through morality or ethics or goodness or achievement or whatever that may be. And they say, oh, I believe. No, you don't. The person who chooses to build on the sand is the one who is seeking to live by their own self-will. Self-fulfillment, self-sufficiency, self-satisfaction, self-righteousness. Ultimately, it's a works-based religion is what it is, and you are the God. Paul describes that kind of person in 2 Timothy 3. He says, having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. Building on the sand is easy. Disregarding Jesus, easy. Going your own way, easy. Doing your own thing, fantastic. Fulfilling your own pleasures, great. Doing your own thing, yeah, fantastic. For a time. For a time. But ultimately, it will all come to a very sad end. It may be an instant satisfaction, an instant reward, an instant pleasure uh, to do it that way. But ultimately, when the storm comes, everything falls apart. The other man, however, he builds his house on the rock. He digs down until he finds bedrock, and he attaches his house, his life, to the rock that does not move the rock that is unchanging, the rock that is stable, the rock that is secure, the rock that offers a great foundation 
for a long and secure life. Building on the rock speaks of a people who hear and who receive, who listen and who act, those who choose to respond to the invitation of Jesus. I wonder if you've responded to the words or to the invitation of Jesus. I wonder if you are building your life upon His certainty, upon His security, upon His rock. He is the one who is worthy of our trust because He's the one that has not changed, does not change, will not change. If you've received the gospel, if you've received Jesus, you're building your life on a rock that is unchangeable, unshakable, steadfast, impenetrable. It cannot be moved. There is nothing and no one that can snatch you from His hand. There is nothing that can separate you from His love. That's good news this evening. That's a great way to build your life, and not just your life, because it will continue then on into into, uh, eternity. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come in to your rest. Come in to the place that I have prepared for you. You see, the Christian believer is the one who receives the Word of God, regardless of what that Word is, regardless of whether we like it or not, because God tells us how we should live and how we shouldn't live, and what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And therefore, the Christian believer is the one who's willing to pay that price, who's willing to walk that path, who's willing to do what the, Lord's instru- instru- what the Lord instructs us to do. If you love me, obey my commands, he said, remember, in John 14. If you love me, obey my commands. My command is build your house upon the rock. Build your life upon the rock. We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands, John says further in 1 John 2. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys His word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know that we are in Him. Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus lived. So, there's two ways. There's two paths. There's, uh, there's two foundations. I wonder what foundation you're building on. One house is built on a firm foundation, faith in the good news of the Lord Jesus. The other is built on the sand of human achievement or religious works or self-righteousness. That's liable to calamity. I wonder which you're building on. Salvation is found in no one else, says God's Word, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus and Jesus alone, Christ and Christ alone, as we sang this morning. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household, Acts chapter 16. As we read in 1 Corinthians 3, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. What's the foundation of your life? What are you building on? Are you building on the solid rock that is Christ? Or are you building your life on the shifting sand? The comparisons, the contrasts, finally, briefly, the consequences. The parable tells us that a storm comes, that the rains fall, that the winds blow, that this is no ordinary storm. This is the storm of a lifetime. But both houses are subject to the storm, and indeed, in the parable, the storm first comes against the one who is built upon the rock. It first comes against the believer. It batters them. In the end, one house stood and one house is destroyed. The house that's built in the sand cannot face the storm. What is the storm uh, a metaphor for here? Well, it's for the judgment of God, isn't it? 
this house on the sand cannot stand the judgment of God, and so it collapses. It crashes down with a great crash. The language that's employed here speaks of, of absolute destruction, gone, swept away like it was never there. You've done that on the beach, right? You build this elaborate sandcastle, looks great. The waves come in, they crash, the tide comes in, you go back the next day, and there's no sign of it. It's like you were never there. So it will be with a person that builds their life on the sand, who builds their life on anything other than Jesus and His gospel, because there is coming a day of judgment. There's coming a day when we will all stand before God and where we will all be judged. The writer of the Hebrews reminds us of that, that it is destined for all men to die once and then to face the judgment. How will you fare on that day? Well, your foundation will have a big part to play. Those who are trusting in their religion, those who are trusting in their good works, those who are trusting in an experience they had 30 years ago or anything else will see their foundation crumble. Notice the word in verse 24, it says, therefore. Therefore, in verse 24, ties this to everything that has come before this in the Sermon on the Mount. All of the information that Jesus has shared with those who are listening to Him. It, it, it refers back to verse 21, uh, verse 21 to 23, that tells the very sad story of very religious people. These people face God, they present Jesus with their self-righteous religious works. And what's the outcome? Away from me, for I never knew you. Jesus will never accept us because of our righteous or our religious acts. He will accept us only in Christ. Does that mean that we shouldn't work hard and do good? Absolutely not. Of course we should. But we shouldn't rely on that. It's not a works-based faith that we own. We work because we have been saved by Jesus. God accepts sinners like you and I into His kingdom because of our relationship with Jesus, the one who has forgiven us by the shedding of His blood, by the bearing of our sins. Whoever is the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life, says 1 John 5. The house that was built on the rock experienced the same storm, the rain, the, fl the flood, the, uh, the wind, but it stood. It might have been shaken, it probably took a battering, but it weathered the storm. Just like we were talking about this morning, that painting entitled Peace, with the scene of, of, of wild weather and waves and spray and lightning and thunder and dark skies and wind howling and these birds asleep content in the nest with their mother looking over them. It's a picture here of what we have, the wind blowing, the rain falling, the judgment of God coming upon us, but being totally at rest, totally at ease, because we're in the nest of Christ. He is the one who is keeping us. He is the one who we have built our life upon. He is the one that we have held on to. He is the one that we have cleaved unto ourselves. We have built our lives on Christ. We will be accepted by God. That's the gospel. This is it. It's exclusive. There's one way or there is the other. There is the way to eternal life and there is the way to eternal condemnation. And the thing is, God is gracious enough to give us the free will to determine where we will go. That's how it works. No excuses. You now know the truth. According to the Word of God, it's not my truth, it's what's presented in Scripture. Listen, you can join the church and still be lost. You can be baptized and still go to hell. You can be a, a good person, at least in the eyes of other people, and still be cast out of the Lord's presence. You can build your life on religious ritual and still be condemned. You can live your life according to atheism or humanism or human wisdom, philosophies, opinion, anything else that you can name, but you will still die. 
and you will still stand before God and His judgment. And if Christ is not your foundation, you will be condemned to hell. But if Jesus is your Lord and He is your Savior, then you will be ushered into the place that He has prepared for you, welcomed with a rich and abundant welcome, the Word uh, tells us. How are you building? Where are you building? On whom are you building? Are you building on the Lord? I hope so, because the storm is coming. And your house, your life is right in its path. When that storm comes, only those houses, only those lives that are built on the foundation that is unshakably, impenetrably God will stand. So if you're on the wrong foundation today, the time is now to call Him in for some underpinning work so that He can secure your foundation and transform your future. If you're in Christ, give thanks that when He comes, He will come with a warm welcome. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we thank You for its truth. We thank You for its solemnity, and it is solemn to know that there are two ways, and that there are perhaps even people that we know, or perhaps even people within the building this evening who will be cast from Your presence as things stand currently. Father, we pray that You would work in hearts and lives. We pray for those who are outside Your kingdom this evening, that they might humble themselves before You, and that they may begin to build upon the rock that is Jesus, immovable, unchangeable, eternal, everlasting God, good, merciful, gracious, true, loving. Lord, we pray that we would all build in the right way, in the right one, to know an entrance and a welcome into your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.